Oh, Magdalena so is here. So this is a weekly call we do with the community. I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start recording it too. Uh, wow, the people here. So I'm going to start the recording now. Recording in progress. All right. So welcome everybody. This is a power. Change the name from synchronicity, synchronicity to power just now on the community discord as well so this is a power weekly call that happens every tuesday at 6 p.m ct so paris time and uh we uh we generally do it either private or public this one is public it's recorded and it's also on uh on youtube live <laughs> i see it now i played uh, with it I, I was interested in sharing this link it's on on my twitter account this is just playing for now um, so we have today a topic which is Web3, and the reason why we picked Web3 is because Power is about ancient and new technologies. So today we're going to focus on new technologies, and I could not have a better host than uh, than Yatsu. That I think I think we know each other yet for about uh, 25 years or something like this. Yeah, something insane. Something insane, like when you can't count anymore. But I, I want to say before introducing you, Yat, that uh, Yat is um, um, a dear friend, obviously, for so many years, but he's also someone that has always supported me and my businesses, and he's also supporting Pawa. And uh, so thank you, Yat, for that. But this is not because you support me that you're here. I would have loved to have you, whether you support it or not because you are one of the top players in crypto and also in uh, the web free space. And the reason why we have this call uh, today is that uh, there is a lot of questions and conversations about web free uh, from members of the community and also from me. And I, I, I will say, as you tweeted, by the way, that was very funny. Join me with my old friend, Loic, who is um, an old web guy or something. <laughs> and, and so I'm learning Web3. So please help us all learn. And so, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? Because I, I see a lot of things about Animal Cab Brands. It's a huge, you have Hello. like 300 plus companies you either started or you even invested in, like OpenSea, the leader of uh, the NFTs. And, uh, and, and you have, yeah, I mean, it's a huge, can you just tell us a few words about maybe about you sure. and then Puka? No, thank, thank you. you. So, um, yeah. First of all, when I tweeted that, I wasn't trying to say that you're old. It's just that we, that you've been in the web for a long time, and I think this is part of that journey, and we can discuss it uh, afterwards a little bit. But um, so quickly, I mean, just a little bit on my background. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up a little differently, uh, although ethnically I'm Chinese. I was born and raised in Austria. Uh, German is my mother tongue, and I think the way that I view the world and how we think of the metaverse and how we build animal brands is a little bit of a reflection of the way that I grew up um, in Europe because um, my mother was a classical musician. I grew up studying music. So I saw a little bit of that world. And I grew up in the 70s and 80s uh, in Vienna. So that was right, you know, you know, when the Cold War still was around. And my mother used to work at the um, at the Komische Oper in Berlin, Berlin, which is basically I guess what was in it used to be Eastern Germany. So to see her, you know, after school, like eventually during breaks, because um, we were actually in different places, I would cross the border and I would witness basically what um, what real communism looked like. Um, and so that was one extreme. So I went from a, living in a socially democratic place to experiencing communism. And then eventually through work, I won't explain the whole background how I got to that. I ended up in the US, which is, you know, hyper capitalism, right, and experienced the world of money in a different way. And then I moved to Hong Kong, which is even more capitalist, <laughs> and even more about money, and, and, and all the issues around that and the benefits of this. So I kind of saw the lens around this. And, and so, so for Animal Cup Brands, what we build, just to fast forward a little bit, is a business that is about delivering true digital property rights. And people look at us as a gaming company because we focused on gaming, but we only focused on gaming because, well, initially, because we felt that gamers today already have a relationship with their virtual goods as one of ownership. Meaning whether you play a game or you have children that play games, you know, they think that the assets that they have inside the game, whether it's a skin or a sword or a car, should be one that they own. 
they, you know, when they talk to their friends, they don't say, oh, that's a nice virtual car. That's a nice racing car you just rented, right? which is actually what's happening. They think you should own it. So they already have that construct in there. Um, and it's a little bit where the world has also changed and moved because there's 3.4 billion people who play games today, which is most of the internet. There's about four and a half or 4.6 billion people online. You know, 3.4 billion people play games. Um, and so generationally speaking, there is already um, a metaverse that has formed as well. And the thinking around um, digital property rights comes around the ownership of data, which we consider as the most valuable resource on earth today, right? And so when we think about history in humanity, it's all about the fight of natural resources and the control over it and you know wars are fought you know countries are born from this and all that kind of stuff the same is emerging here except these countries today look different you know we think of you know facebook as an empire we think of apple as you know a sort of a, a major sort of you know like say feudal feudal kingdom because every time that when we use these platforms every time we use facebook we don't think of us creating getting a benefit of their service we think that we're working for them because we give our data to them right? and they monetize the data. And because we don't know the value of that data, um, we're basically surrendering all of our digital sovereignty, all of our digital rights. Inversely, if we stop using Facebook, what's the value of Facebook? Nothing, actually, right? If we stop using Twitter. There's no value in Twitter whatsoever. So we are the contributors of the value because we, we generate network effects for it. And the power of data is that it has the ability to generate limitless network effects, because actually that is what, you know, human knowledge can do as well, right? Like, you know, a physical resource like oil has an ability to create certain network effects, but it only becomes interesting because of human ingenuity, right? It only becomes interesting because of, of, of what we do to it, not because inherently, uh, you know, oil has a natural quality in and of itself. Um, and, and so this formation of these ideas now is no longer owned by us. So we're digital dependents. If Facebook or Twitter, as Luik also painfully experienced, and we with the App Store ourselves, removes you from the platform, you don't only lose your business, you also lose your digital identity. Your, um, you know, your Instagram handle that you may have you know, sort of built up to 10 million followers, you don't actually own that, right? It can be removed at any time. So which means that, again, you are subservient to a digital platform that uh, sort of controls all this. And like Luik, in the early days of the internet, we were big, big believers in open source. You know, the internet was sort of this sort of really sort of open system of information. They would create more sort of equity of a different kind, knowledge equity. Uh, and, you know, in Web2, that became centralized because we couldn't make sense of the data. We also gave it away because we didn't know that data was valuable to us because that data to us isn't that valuable. Um, and so with Web3 and why blockchain is so interesting and what attracted us to why we built Animoca brands in this way is that for the first time, data, which is always a private good, you know, retained in the database of, let's say, Facebook um, with their permission because it's in their system, now is a public good, which means all of the things that Jeez. we can now transact and verify and audit becomes public not just accountable, but also something that um, that we can now construct open uh, network effects on it. Um, and non-fungible tokens to us represent it as the best way to do that, because we can now blend in our personal human identity through digital assets, because we think of anything we purchase or anything we do as part of our social identity. Like, you know, the clothes you wear, you know, they don't have to be expensive, right? But, but you know, or the, the place you live in, Right. These, are, these are all social identifiers um, of who you are. You, you, you want to wear this shirt or you want to be seen with this car or you want to do whatever. These all say something about you. So assets are social identifiers. They identify who you are. Um, and in the digital world, we do this already. Our kids you know, love their skins. It says something about them, except they can't own it. Um, and then with that, you can have then these capital formation. And with the capital formation, the value redistributes around you know, just how physical property rights have redistributed power from feudal societies into democratic capitalist ones. And with this decentralization of power, you have a new balance of equity. And the final thing I'll say about this is that, you know, because we are the generators of this data, we are unlike, you know, when you physically own land, you, you know, you own the land, therefore you get the benefits of this land. This, you know, but that might be scarce. 
the resource of the metaverse is data, and we are the generators of the data, which means that we are sort of the wellspring of ideas, and we can always generate our own form. So we think that you know, instead of the future of, of being a kind of universal basic income, it would be more of a universal basic equity, where we don't necessarily make the same amount of money, but we are contributors to the network, and therefore always generate some value um, you know, going forward. So you know, outside of building our own businesses like Sandbox and so on, we have over 20 good companies. Uh, we employ about 900 people today within the group, but we've made outside of that an additional 380 investments today uh, in Animoca Brands is because we take a different approach to investing. We're not a VC, so we don't have a fund. So, so, so some the criticism would be, well, isn't that like scattershot investing? Are you just like throwing money around and sort of, you know, spray and pray type of thing? And 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 our, our view on this one, we're not investing in companies just because we hope they all make a return, because that would be the VC approach, right? I want to invest in this company and have like a you know, 10x, 20x, or 30x, and so I need to diligently look for the winner. Instead, we're trying to find companies that construct the network effects of digital property rights as an NFTs to build the Web3 space. So an example would be gaming guilds. We've made a lot of investments in gaming guilds that promote gaming. It's probably not a good idea to invest in you know, the 15 gaming guilds that we did, because arguably they could compete with each other, and arguably not, you know, not all of them will be super successful. But they, what they do do is they onboard lots of users into Web3. They give value to the, you know, in their particular economies. Um, they may never be you know, a 10x success per se, maybe some will. Um, but they grow the whole ecosystem as a whole, which means the rest of our portfolio and our main businesses grow and thrive as a result of that. Right? So we don't look at investments solely for the purposes of each company must have a financial return, but rather what does each company do to grow the network effect or the shared network effect that we think Web3 will have, which is why we continue to invest aggressively. So sorry, that was a long preamble. But no, 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 no. Yeah, can we come back? So just so you know here, um... Power and synchronicity are, are also a community about consciousness and uh, you know even spirituality some, some somehow which we, we are, we're not sure what exactly this means but I'm just saying that some of us here might not uh, including me with a few things you said might not be totally knowledgeable so expect any type of question but I'll ask you one can you define what is a web free business because uh, I, I am building a business right now. Yeah. And so I, I the way bold, like I want everything to be web free. So what is it? Like if we start a business today, what is a web, a web free? To business? build web three to us is to build on chain. And to build on chain means you have to build on a public blockchain from our perspective. Right. And what it means is that everything you build is, you know, um, becomes like an open layer, open abstraction that you can then compose freely on top of. Because whatever you build on Web3, that ownership can be transferred to someone else, and then they can build their own network effects and own that. So this is essentially, um, you know, the one expression that people have given is, you know, if, if Web1 is read and Web2 is read-write, then Web3 is, is, is read-write and owned. Right? But so now, I'm going to play the devil's advocate or of a stupid guy, or I am sometimes, I mean, it doesn't matter. But I, I, as you said, we were all dreaming in 93, 95 about an internet open, right? With uh, Tim Berners-Lee and Wikipedia. And, and the joke is all we got is Facebook and Google, um, <laughs> right? And so here, you're, what you're saying is basically put everything public on the blockchain. So like, for example, we started, so we sell tickets to Power Paris, please all join October 14th and 15th. And we picked a uh, web free company called Guts, uh, which sells tickets, and it's all on the blockchain. So that means that anyone can verify who bought a ticket to Power, if I understand well. It, and really right. the reason why we checked it is that we took this rather than taking, you know, um, traditional options is that we, we wanted to be able to make it, you know, also a little special. So when you get a ticket, the day of a conference, it will turn into an NFT, which will go on uh, open sea. If you go to all the power events, maybe you have a collection of NFTs, we can build something on it. I always had this idea that I wanted to do NFTs with, uh, you know, the feathers of indigenous and I, I have like some in my, behind me and, and like, who knows, you know, so 
what what does it mean? That means that another business, now I'm going back to a bigger question. Like if I share so much, like another business can come and take all the source code and also steal it or build on top of it. So they, so they can't steal the source code per se, maybe if it's depending on what you've built on it, right? But they can get access to your customers by offering them a service to say, everyone who bought a ticket to Power, I can offer you a service too because you were a Power customer. Now, the classic Web2 model of thinking is, oh, that's stealing my customer. That's bad because obviously, you know, I, the customer I spent so much money acquiring will now move to a potential competitor. It's going to run a, you know, Power2 or whatever. A web and, summit. And, yeah, exactly. Well, web Summit, right? And, 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 and you know, Web Summit goes, every Power customer will give you 20% off. Come, come, come to me, right? So that's that seems to be the threat. But of course, they did that uh, anyway. We, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but the alternative on this is to say, well, actually, now the power membership is valuable because I have power membership. Other people want me, right? So in other words, because I am now this community of people that are very focused on consciousness and maybe ancient technologies combined with newer technologies is a very specific group. And so the membership of power starts to become more value. And so when and maybe this membership might, in the case of a PFP example, might only have 10,000 memberships. It doesn't have to be limited like this, but it's an example. Then in order for me to be part of this member, I would need to buy it from someone else. And every time the transaction happens to become that member, the original organization yourself receives a cut in the transaction fee. And so you end up making a different kind of sustainable revenue based on the network effects that the membership of power provides rather than selling more power tickets every single time, right? And so through the membership of this NFT, you could form 50 different power-like organizations. Like within this community, someone can say, you know what, I'm gonna form a power chapter in, I don't know, New York or something, right? Well, how do I know if you're a power member, in fact? I don't, uh, you know, unless I go and talk to you and say, oh, Louis, can you verify if this person actually attended power? No, by just having the NFT, I know that I have at least shown my membership to this one and then I can form a local chapter and therefore create an added network effect on, on top of the original membership that you grew. So, so this is the benefit, right? And it's great for small companies because you don't have the ability to build network effects like this otherwise. Now, if you're a large company, you can, you know, the, um, they may seem like a threat if you are an almost monopoly, but the other way to think of it is actually it's an anti-monopolistic feature of Web3. So take, for instance, what OpenSea had with LooksRare. O OpenSea, you know, all of its, anyone who traded on OpenSea, what LooksRare did was, they did what's known as a vampiric attack. They said, everyone who, who uh, um, traded an NFT in the last six months on OpenSea, you can come to LooksRare and we'll give you free tokens, like an introductory token for you to trade on LooksRare. So obviously what happened is every OpenSea customer is like, well, you know, I'm gonna go try it on LooksRare. And so they acquired all these customers uh, and even though it didn't become a major competitor to OpenSea, it created a sort of a service, uh, a new add-on there. Now, the response for OpenSea in a Web2 model is to close it off, which is what Facebook and Twitter does with APIs. We shut you off and you can't do this anymore, right? But in the Web3 model, you can't do that because the ownership of that data, the sovereignty is yours. So you as a customer get to decide whether OpenSea or LooksRare is better. That means... OpenSea's job is not to make the mode harder for you to leave. OpenSea's job is to make it better for you as a customer to stay with it. So this is the philosophical difference between the competition, where true competition evolves because someone else can say, hey, I, you know, like imagine if Facebook's data was truly open and its APIs could never be closed. Well, <laughs> well what will happen is, is that, you know, Facebook has to evolve itself in many ways to ensure that it can keep its customers by making sure it provides not only the best service, but maybe the most ethical service or the most moral service. I don't know, whatever that may be. And today we do this in the real world. We choose to do things like we might pay more money for organic food, or we might pay more money for sustainable technologies because we have a, you know, a sense of duty or a sense of community, and we don't mind doing that. We consciously choose to do that as a consumer, as opposed to um, being forced to buy something. Right? And in a digital world, we couldn't do this before, but now with non-fungible tokens, you can. Mm -hmm. right? So, so the, the, the freedom of this is, is what's important because now the layer 
of data is completely auditable across across all networks. Just one question, and then I think we can start opening to everybody here, of course. I'm really curious to, to hear about Thierry and, and, and Daniel as well. <laughs> but uh, uh, just one more, one more question, and I, I don't want to talk about the power business, but in general, I would like to do that as well. But if you can answer in general, I have obviously, like many here, looked at tokens and bought some tokens, lost money, made money, mostly lost money, to be honest, but let's not get in there. Or maybe someone asked that question, I won't. But I, I see it as 2001. Everything crashed, great, now we can do the real business. Um, here's the question. All, all the good tokens seem to have DAOs. So a place where the community can go and vote on projects, subject projects, um, su submit, sorry, projects and say what they want. Sometimes, honestly, it kind of feels fake that they, they see the votes, but they, they do something else. Or, you know, I, I don't really know. But I like that a lot as an approach of saying, OK, like, for example, for an event, it would be who you want as a speaker, right? And everybody votes. I would, I would like to do that right now, actually. Maybe you can help me set up a down in, in a second. But so that's the first thing. And then there is the, the, the token itself, right? I, I have also, I honestly, I'm kind of dreaming about this, like having we have uh, about 40 people who want to volunteer for the event and help and or more, I don't know. And and like they can do, you we could help on the content, they could help on welcoming people, I don't know. But if we had a power token, then we could start saying, okay, here are some tokens for that. And so I would like to do this too. How difficult is it for an entrepreneur? Let's forget power for a second. But if you want to do those two things, like a voting place, right where the community can can be a shareholder somehow that's how i understand the tokens and i love that it's like uh instead of going public you you just issue tokens and two like this voting mechanism where it becomes kind of a is it a democracy can you talk a little over sure. the two things thank so, you so so the first thing is the tools are there so for instance um you know there's platforms like snapshot which already has a voting mechanism token gated systems Right, um, where you're basically able to do all this type of stuff if you want. And, and that's what we use for ApeCoin, which is a, you know, probably a pretty big DAO at this point, uh, which is the, you know, started off with the Board Apes community, but now is, is fairly large. Um, and people vote on actions like literally every week. We have like five or six things that you know, we vote on. And, um, and then as, um, on the council, we you know, obviously approve what gets decided on, what, what can get voted on if it makes sense, but we don't, you know, we don't decide. We just execute the wishes of the community. So it is, in some form, maybe um, very much a, uh, a a sort of a direct democracy in, in that sense, which may be good or bad things. And and by the way, some DAOs are structured in a delegated system, so it's more representative. And and, and I'll you know before I sort of specifically talk about some of the execution things, one way to think about blockchain, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies aside, is that actually. Um, we don't think of blockchain purely as a technology because from a database sign point, you know, it's inefficient. It's got a few things that, you know, it's not faster than MySQL, right? You know, what's the whole point, but actually the transparent framework around this, really what blockchain is, is a political and social system embedded with technology because it means that anytime you make any decision, like with Ethereum as a foundation, if you want, you know, to move from, you know, basically the new ETH staking protocol and, and emerge, People had to vote on it, right? And every person who owns Ethereum got to decide whether ETH should stay proof of work or move to proof of stake, for instance. It's so a can massive you pause here on, yeah, Can you pause here on this one for a second? Steve Jobs has not invented the iPhone by listening to customers, right? Right. So he, he, we had Nokia and Ericsson, and they were not very good compared right. to an iPhone now, right? Then copied by Android. But here's the thing is that that's always like, I love this interaction with the community. The community here knows, I love it. I, I listen as much as possible. And sometimes I just do something. <laughs> so yes. how do you, like, basically it's a question about the wisdom of the crowds, right? It's like, so I, I don't so think, I think, I don't think Job read the internet or talked to focus groups or got votes to do the iPhone or not. He woke up no, one day and... Right. Um, so I think there's a few, few, few things to think about. The first one is the consensus mechanism for a decision for the entire protocol to go to. Does not mean that an individual cannot do 
what he or she would like to do individually. For instance, I can build anything I want on Ethereum. I don't need the Ethereum community to agree on this. I can just use the token and build a protocol of my own or build an application, a dApp or a game and just launch it. But I, am, I have the benefit of at least launching it on the Ethereum platform to the entire community. And you basically, uh, um, um, you know, maybe promote it to them and they can use their tokens if they want it as currency. But it, most importantly, what Ethereum, the blockchain does is it provides the trust layer of transaction. But the value of using Ethereum is I can now trust what's in there. Because if I send you this token or if I send you this NFT, I know it's really sent to you. Right? So it, it takes care of that. And the real innovation, by the way, on blockchain for the financial industry, for instance, is that you now have a financial infrastructure that would normally cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for any bank to build, but now is public infrastructure, which is the reason why, you know, some kid can run a DeFi protocol that can run a yield program that is effectively like a lending facility that normally only Goldman Sachs could build. But, you know, it's, it's not that different from you know, how code amateurized services as well, right? What blockchain did is it amateurized this type of trust technology um, at a scale because now you can trust that, right? Uh, because, because it's got the redundant mechanisms. You know, if you remember to build a really strong database with all the redundant mechanisms, we'd hire the best engineer, the best database guy, you know, like it was almost impossible to get this person, Never mind the infrastructure to build like your own mini Amazon. Right? And that now is public infrastructure for anyone to compose on. So that's one, right? So you're always free to do your own thing. But then the other part is that if you want to be able to uh, elect you know, the crowds to come with you, you have a way of reaching all of them. Right? It's as if you could always contact Facebook users somehow, because every wallet address is known. Right? You, can, you can go after them and say, we offer something cool, or come vote or something as a, as a mass proposal. Um, and then the, the, the third point I would say is, that to us, the DAO is exciting because it's essentially a digital Many democracy, people. but it can now innovate democratic systems at the pace of technology. So if you innovate on a democracy in the real world, it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> you can screw it up. And if you, if you mess it up, then it can have very disastrous effects because you don't have sort of, you can't, you can't MVP a democratic system. Uh, with real people involved in it. But in a DAO, you can do that, right? Which means there'll be many DAOs that fail, but those that come with superior systems will become the model in which actual democracies can learn from because I now have a simulated model. I can see whether this you know, governance system is working. I mean, we're still building off democratic frameworks based on the American constitution. I mean, it's great. It's clearly redundant and not really resilient, but it is after all, I mean, you know, three, 400 years old, right? You know, so it is subject to some innovations, which you can't really do because it's risky um, if, if, you, if you do it otherwise. So, so you can experiment in the metaverse, as we have with technology broadly, right? Like if you think about the things we build in technology, and then, you know, we bring it to real life as well for, for those effects. So, uh, and the, the last point I'll say about this is that uh, I think sometimes people forget, I think that, you know, the, the value of a democratic system is that it's meant to bring, it's meant to lift everyone up. Right. So instead of saying, well, you know, I only want to elect the top leaders in and of itself to run the country. Actually, the leader's job is to bring everyone to a higher level so that whatever he's trying to do is understandable to you so that you'll agree to it. Right? As opposed to just give me a blanket vote to do whatever I want, right? um, which is a more elitist approach. Right? The strong leaders are actually the ones who, who don't just empathize with the audience, with, with, their, with, with their community, but also to basically bring them to a level where they appreciate why your approach is better. And, and for that reason, you know, if you look at, for instance, I think back in, 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 in ancient Greece, actually they invented democracy, right? But Socrates was really much against it because he was worried about the tyranny of the masses. In fact, he struggled from this because the masses didn't understand because they were probably ignorant and eventually he got executed. But, 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 uh, but today that doesn't happen because we have different ideas about human rights. We have different values. We, we don't throw um, Christians to the lions. You know, like we, we have, we have, a, we have, a, we have a, a, a framework where a democratic system now makes a bit more sense. And eventually, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years will evolve even further. And so my, my, my broad sense is that uh, DAOs advance it faster because it forces, like for instance, every time we do a proposal on ApeCoin, 
um, it forces the press, the proposer, to educate the entire community why it's a good thing, right? Which is basically just another form of education. Yet I will open to Thierry, but before I say that, I, I, I um, or before Thierry comments or asks a question, and then Daniel, um, it's kind of sad though, that the only country that really tried to move on with crypto is Ecuador, right? And ended up buying a shitload of crypto at $65, and now it's 20. Uh, it's like, I, I would love to see a country experiment with DAOs instead, but it, this is so sad right now. Like the, the guy was- well, like, Just so you know, um, in the US, Wyoming is probably the only state in the US and perhaps even in the world that has legalized DAOs. Which is interesting. So if you do, uh, if you, if you, so they actually recognize DAOs as legal structures. So it's happening. And in the UK, they are starting to debate digital property rights as an actual property. So, so it's beginning, right? Because you know, before Bitcoin or before crypto as a form of digital ownership, that wasn't even a possible construct, right? Um, digital rights is like air. It's like how can I legalize this? So therefore, it's based on contract, right? But you know, if we start moving to a world where these things actually have a real property right, then it's a completely different kind of protection, right? All right. I uh, will uh, open the floor. Thierry, you want to comment yes. on a question for Yat? Yes, thank you, Loic, and thank you, Yat, for uh, for all these works. They're interesting. Um, I So I'm, uh, we are currently building a, a music platform and uh, we're implementing a, a few Web3 services. One of them is, uh, you know, uh, re registering your work, your music, uh, the original work. So before you had a tape or you had a, a you know, a physical band. And so now really to record your digital, really original work. That's something we do, for example. And when you were talking, I was wondering, because all of this, when my question is, when do you see it becoming mainstream? Because you were talking about, you know, owning your digital assets, but it's still, today, it's still esoteric. You still need to code or you still need to have a wallet, which is today not very easy to have a wallet. Um, so when do you see blockchain becoming mainstream in the sense that anyone from my grandmother to my, to my children being able to access, you know, data on, on a blockchain. So for example, you know, today my, my grandmother, when she's streaming music, she doesn't know she's streaming music, but she's playing a button on the net and she's listening to music, but she doesn't know the technology behind it streaming. So because what you said is very important about democracy, owning your data, uh, that question of ownership, but how do you see it becoming, you know, mainstream that anyone could have access to it? So I, um, first of all, I agree with you, um, but I used to be very much in the camp of we need to make it as accessible and as easy as possible. And while that's still to an extent true, there is a lesson here that if you make it too easy, too accessible, then you begin to lose why it works and why it's valuable because you take it for granted. So I think of this as, you know, like I, I live in Asia. And we have a different kind of appreciation to a democratic system than I would argue Americans have today. Because I think Americans take democ democracy maybe for granted because it's been there for so long. You, you should have 80 or 90% participation rights if you thought this was truly valuable to you. Right? And whereas with younger democracies, you have very high participation rates because it's meaningful, because they fought for it or they thought it was critical. So I think there's an element, there's a balance there, which is we need to make things convenient so it's not a hassle, but we can't lose the lesson of why it's important. So decentralization is the same. The more convenient you are, the less decentralized you become because you need to give ownership of your assets to custodian. It's a little bit like, do you, are you, you know, the owner of your identity, or do you give the ownership to someone else to manage it for you for your convenience, right? Uh, and and so, 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 so while it's obviously, you know, it's somewhat philosophical, but it's meaningful as well. Like for instance, really strong crypto pundits don't even want to put their tokens in an exchange. They're like, I'm holding it in my cold wallet and it's there because they're really strong believers in property rights, right? 
Um, and, you know, and, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm not at all someone who's pro-gun or something, but it's a little bit the same idea about people who are pro-gun, for instance, who are like, well, I, I need to have the right of this, right? It's, you know, who, why do we need to outsource safety to ourselves, right? That seems ridiculous from a European perspective, but maybe to an American, for some Americans, this is absolutely sacrosanct. This is very religious to them almost because it's their duty and their sense of um, a, 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 um, a sort of a responsibility almost for a certain group of people that you have the right to, to, to do that, right? And so I think decentralization follows a similar ethos as well, that you don't need everyone to do this, but you need enough people to do it so that you can keep it decentralized. Because the issue with Web 1 to Web 2 is that we gave it away to the platforms because of convenience, partially also because convenience didn't, the, the value wasn't there for us. We didn't understand the, its value, so we gave it away because compared to convenience and the value, convenience won over. But in Web3, you have value. If you, for instance, in the extreme case, have a board ape, you're not going to give it to someone else, right? Because it's now worth a lot. So that value in itself is sufficient for you to wish to defend it and to ensure that it's protected and that it can't be stolen from you or taken from you, right? And so this is this is part of that sort of uh, sort of a push and pull. Now, one of our earliest um, uh, biggest investments in in, in game game uh, gamefi is Axie Infinity. And Axie Infinity really grew in the Philippines. And what was fascinating about Axie was that it grew, you know, it grew because of COVID, but it grew in the Philippines in a community that didn't have university education for the most part, couldn't even get a credit card because they were unbanked, and yet they knew how to open a crypto wallet, and they were basically playing a blockchain game that perhaps many people in the West would say, oh, this is so complicated. But actually opening up a MetaMask wallet and getting comfortable with crypto is easier than opening a bank account at your local Chase or Citibank, right? You don't have to show your ID, you don't have to do the same thing. Actually, it's easier. It's just unfamiliar, right? So that's one, one, one aspect to think about. That doesn't mean we can't do things better or that we can be more efficient, but the ethos of decentralization, I think, is, is really important because it's self-custody, self, sort of your own sovereignty, managing your, managing your, your, your own identity, I think, is a, is a critical component. So it's education. And if you look at social norms today, there's a lot of social norms we do today that might be considered awkward for someone, you know, 500 years in the past, like, you know, things that we do that now are normal to us because they have become patterns, uh, you know, like, I don't know, the way we dress, social behavior, shaking hands, serving people, I don't know, right? <laughs> so, so social norms that we've come to accept. Um, um, and by the way, this always happens as well when people from the US want to do business in China, they struggle because they just don't understand the social norms, right? There's some things that are complicated and only someone who has grown up in China or has grown up in a culture like that or Japan understands, you know, how to deal with this. And again, it's, it's complicated, but it's innate to them. And, and I don't think we can, we can make that easier. So I think education is the more important part than just making it super convenient. Of course, there's a, there's a dynamic, but broadly speaking, that's kind of how we think about it. Thank you yet, uh, Daniel. And then I would love to have uh, for balance, uh, if possible, a woman ask a question. So if you can just raise a hand, uh, just for balance. Yeah. Daniel. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't know if I really had a question. Um, did I raise my hand? Um, you always have uh, a question, Daniel, or push back, like something like something controversial yes, please. or like like uh, crypto is going to destroy the world. Yeah. Like, I'm just expecting something really pushing back yet on, on something just for for entertainment, please. Mm. Uh, OK, got it. Well, yeah, I, mean, I really, really enjoyed uh, his talk. Uh, and I went and read as, as he was talking to me a uh, piece which I posted on ownership and capitalism. Um, so, yeah, I'd have to ruminate on it a little bit, but I mean, um, one issue for me, and I, you brought up, I thought it was very interesting, digital identity uh, uh, in the beginning. Um, and I'm wondering how Web3 can help solve that. So at the moment, I mean, that was, I, I had a company many years ago called Evolver, and we were trying to, um, you know, we were hoping to sort of deal with the, with the Web Identity Project. I and mean, apparently when, you know, when the internet started, it was scientists, and um, they were excited about it for research. So they never really thought about the concept of digital identity. 
uh, which then ultimately became the reason why the Web3 has kind of like backfired so intensively, right? Because um, everybody kind of owns your identity, you know, fragmented across uh, all these platforms. Mm. Uh, do you, you know, do you see a, a solution to that in, in the open metaverse, like a way that people can have yes. like a sacrosanct holder uh, of their own identity? So, I mean, Vitalik proposed something called Soulbound, um, which are basically um, sort of NFTs that can't leave your wallet as a way to create your identity. I have conflicting thoughts about it, but it's, a, it's one method, right? Because the wallet address is your identity. And with that identity, you can then basically know that, oh, this is Luigi's wallet, and I always know what's in there, that he is who he is, right? Uh, kind of thing. And the transactions he does, or the things he, 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 he performs on his wallet, which is publicly available, gives an indication as to you know, who he is. That, by the way, that identity could be anonymous, right? Like people collect certain NFTs or do stuff, but I can still see through the transaction whether he's a good actor or a bad actor. You know, who he transacts with, what he does, is a way to create credibility, right? And that's the whole sort of benefit for, in some ways, the, the zero knowledge aspect where I can anonymously transact with someone, but yet still have the benefit of a person's history based on his wallet, right? Now, there is an argument to be made that we should have multiple identities. And I think in the real world, we do that anyway, meaning that I am, you know, a certain person with my family, and we're all the same people. But in our identities, we're not necessarily mix them, right? At work, I'm a certain person. With my friends, I'm a certain person. Maybe with my high school mates, I'm a certain person. Well, and with my family, I'm a different person. person. With my mom, I'm definitely a different person, right? So, so, so we all people. have um, slightly different ways in which we sometimes have our personas, um, and we, um, which, which we prefer. And we see this in the gaming world, right? <laughs> Where someone who plays Fortnite isn't the same identity or persona when he's playing Apex Legends or when he's on Dota or when he's on Roblox or on Minecraft, right? Uh, they don't necessarily play the same with the, the, with the same friends. So I think um, there's there's some argument to be made that different personas and personalities in some ways is a form of our identity formation. But speaking of sort of, you know, um, digital identity, you can form these identities and create them because you have, you know, an asset ownership that is verified. Like you own this board ape, okay, that's who you are. And that's your identity, and I recognize that. And nobody else can take that away from you, right? Um, because it's actually yours. Uh, and if someone was to forge it, well, you know what? The actual original, with the original hash ID is only one. So nobody can actually take that away. That's the other thing, right? On Instagram, people forge photos, forge identities. You know, <laughs> you know, a number of us, including myself, often have fake Instagram accounts because you just take my photo and put it on Instagram and you know, take my name and just give me a dash or something. And then, you know, you, if you're not careful, you might get scammed. That type of stuff you can't do on Web3 because you have a unique identifier. Um, and eventually this type of stuff on the application level will be easily discovered, right? Which is also, you know, the, the perfect solution for things like um, sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, royalties and just property, right? Like that's why when I trade a piece of art, I know that this is authentic art and therefore I'm willing to pay a royalty versus this is a forgery and therefore I don't, I don't want that. So. So I think that's definitely, um, you know, a plus point um, around that because of the on-chain um, verification. Amazing! Thanks so much. It was fascinating. Uh, yeah, I'd love to like to be in touch with you further. Are you going to put like your email in the chat? Or uh... yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, very generous with his time with us. Um, Natalia, Nicola, I'm going to skip keep you for now, just for now, because. Uh, we need some balance. Because balance. <laughs> Natalia, if you can, are you here? All yeah, right, so thank you. We're listening to you. I made the internet happen. I'm completely offline these days, and uh, this meeting was like, I need to make everything possible to make it happen. Really glad to be here. Uh, to me, blockchain technology and Web3 is spiritual technology. A very spiritual technology. If we really make it the way that is in a balanced and very aware way, we can really create a new type of humanity in a way that is really creating a new uh, governmental layer uh, that helps us and allows us to create a global society of individuals that are stronger together to create something that is beyond uh, digital identity. It's the identity of the global citizen, of the human, of the planet Earth. And really stop, start dropping bits and pieces of wisdom, such as plant medicine and 
uh, the wisdom of the moon and the wisdom of the planets and the wisdom of balance, truth, um, pause. And uh, the question for you guys, I'm, I'm really curious to see um, like this, this word decentralization, okay? It's pretty hyped up. Nobody really knows what it means. Um, to me, decentralization is ability to outsource uh, the skills that I don't have to someone else uh, in a way that is trustless, in a way that is unconditional, and allow the flow of the universe uh, to flow uh, through the reflection of someone else. Yet, I'm currently working on something like that I call Web3 um, Media Alliance and um, redefining what media is. I'm coming from Russia and it's really uh, edgy to call yourself a media, <laughs> you know. Um, so the Media Alliance is uh, decentralizing media completely and uh, seeing every single individual as a source of information. I think we all started to do that deeper in 2020. And my question is to the speakers and those that are aware about the Web3 world is what do you guys follow to stay on track uh, for the topic of the Web3? Because right now, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've gone through stages and stages of keeping up, but my mental health has been, you know, in this type of way as I, I was really trying my best to be on top of the news. It's a lot. It's Discord, it's uh, Twitter, it's uh, direct communications through Signal and Telegram. It's all these conferences that are happening right now. It's really a lot. And I'm really curious to see how um, those that are in the space keep up with everything and what are the hacks around that. And thank you, Luik, and thank you, Magdalena. Nice to see you all. Um, OK, so I guess there's a bunch of things. First of all, lo lovely, lovely, lovely topic. Um, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, I do agree. I mean, blockchain is, you know, to be thought of as a political system, right? And as a social system and has the potential to append things partially because of its very transparent framework. Um, and I think the other thing that's really powerful is that whatever you drop on blockchain is there permanently or could be there permanently. And therefore, you know, a legacy is preserved effectively for eternity, which, which is, um, both scary, but also powerful if you want to leave something behind, right? Now, in, in terms of um, your question as to how to keep up with things. So I think, um, I don't know that there is an answer of, let's go and go to every conference and talk to every person. And I think there was protocol here nations, right? They have a particular culture, they have their particular setup, they are built on the time senses. And the economic activity, by the way, if you want to measure that, should be viewed like a GDP from our perspective as well. So you don't view blockchain like a like like a like, like a P and L. Oh come on. the internet. Recording in progress. But in order for me to get strong, I study a lot of philosophy and sociology. I don't actually go to a blockchain conference necessarily. The blockchain test about sort of you know smart contract deployments. I mean that's helpful too sometimes. But I I I, I go reread you know Mark and Smith and I study study things around in you know, basically um, you know um, even Mark you know I agree with it but understand it and just implement in terms of the incentive system in system or the token systems and it makes sense and what the thing behind is you know because you know, we construct ourselves like how do you distribute more equity. You know, what is 
what would be considered justice, right? Um, the justice is good internet, please. Apparently you just don't keep up. That's the answer. Do, 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 do. 